Welcome, students, to this uh, exploration of a scene from Rachel Perkins's 2001 operatic non-feature film, One Night the Moon. In this particular video presentation, we'll be exploring Unfinished Business, a very powerful duet in the film and its kind of uh, discography in which I think Perkins is attempting to articulate with her own unique cultural voice that notion of reconciliation. I think we have to be reflective of the fact that Perkins herself articulates many times that her as a director, as an auteur, because we know that she had a hand in the crafting of the film's script, is aiming to communicate to a more, I suppose, broad Australian audience and an international audience due to the film's success of the Cannes, the, the, the Cannes Film Festival that attempt by her to bridge the gap between white and black Australia and an effort to educate, educate white Australia, educate uh, general Australia about the importance of Indigenous issues. So we're going to look at this piece of music and a few things to note from the outset. When discussing this text, remember, we're focusing in on language, identity, and culture. You want to be talking about the language of cinematography and the musicality of this scene. You want to talk about not only Perkins' utilization of numerous rule of third shots, her use of cuts to move between close-ups and medium and long and establishing scenic shots, you want to talk about the use of an immersive musical score that is sung diegetically, especially in this particular scene. Unlike other things like um, I Don't Know Anything Anymore, the film's opening scene, but also uh, Little Bones. Uh, those are clearly uh, operatic soliloquies. They're arias sung by a single artist to communicate those deeply profound cultural and identifiable qualities. So we're going to have a look at this scene. I'm going to play and stop and play and stop as we go, just to recap and explore some of these concepts. So the scene actually opens, and I'm utilizing the Sydney Film Festival's website and digital uh, repository of this particular film, so I thank them very much for that. Uh, and it makes it widely accessible to all HSC students. So the scene opens with a point of view shot. We're actually going to be looking at the landscape from the perspective of Rose Ryan sitting on her porch. Uh, what I've often heard as being veranda bound. Uh, she is fixed by place. And if I were looking to articulate that concept, I would be talking about how Rachel Perkins utilizes her own unique cultural voice as a woman, as an indigenous woman, an Arente woman, to explore the issue that affected women in the 1930s and how those issues still permeate into the context of her film's composition in 2001 and into our 21st century contemporary audience. So let's have a look. So immediately already, just previously, we have beautiful panoramic, scenic, long establishing shots of the mountain ranges that surround the Ryan property. We can see the mist, the fog descending on the mountains. Remember that notion of symbolism of fog, of being obscure, of being unclear or uncertainty. And then immediately it cuts to this great scene of Rose seated in the rule of thirds, on the veranda, veranda bound, bound to place. And remember, in the context of the film's setting, the diegesis of the film, she is a woman in the 1930s. She is marred and effectively manacled by the expectations of Australian society of the time, of a woman's place being attached to property. Because in many ways, she, like her sisters, were property to many men. And we see this as a recurring concept throughout Australian literature. Don't get confused, but if we think about Henry Lawson's The Drover's Wife, the fact that the 
the titular figure, the drover's wife, she is bound to the property while the drover is out exploring. So many of these concepts translate. So we've cut now immediately from those beautiful mountain-esque vistas, obviously connecting to that Aboriginal spirituality and connection with country to this place on the veranda in this rule of third shot, a beautiful long shot here. We've got a bit of setting and we've got her position on the armchair looking with offering gaze out into the distance. What is she looking for? She's contemplative. She's exploratory. She is considering her place as a woman. And I think in many ways, Perkins is encouraging us to think about those notions through her unique directorial voice. Okay, the way this scene opens up immediately, we transition through cuts. And remember, this is something Perkins will utilize expertly. She will cut between shots. We're immediately moved to a shot from the rear, seeing Rose sitting up from her armchair, from her, her kind of rocking chair, um, about to enter into this piece. The musicality of the scene, the, 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 the riffs and chords of the guitar starting to play to this piece. And she's taking action. She is now becoming affirmative within herself. Remember, this is very late in the film. We're in the third act of this operatic film. We're in a stage where Rose, lambasted by her husband's prejudice and his controlling disposition, iconic of masculinity of the time, and in a lot of ways, early 21st century masculinity, is now no longer subjugated by those ideas. She's in fact taking action here. She's getting up, she's moving beyond. And notice the beautiful mise-en-scene here. We have these, uh, you know, veranda posts, support posts, obviously intended to post as a pitch up the roof, but you could t suggest they serve as metaphoric symbols of her entrapment, her incarceration, due to male expectation of women in the time. And she's no longer bound by those. She's becoming self-assertive and she's going to break free of those. And this is the positive tone of this music. Okay, the way it inflects her awareness, her epiphany, and coming to terms with her plight and realizing that as unfinished business starts to clean up, that she needs to take action now. Every day I'm with the child. She walks on my dreams. Again, got to appreciate Perkins's transition between shots through her use of clean cuts, but also the lyrics of this piece of music while accompanied by this melodic guitar rifts and chords. I'm with the child, she walks on my dreams. These suggestive metaphors of the presence of this child in her life, Emily, whose fate at this point in the film we are uncertain of. Though we are aware through the recurring motif of the moon that time has elapsed, we are well aware that at this point, Rose is near to the end of a month cycle of the moon. It has been 28 plus days, and there is a good chance that Rose is not surviving. But like a hopeful mother, she is uncertain of her daughter's fate, and she is questioning, you know, the fact that this, this particular girl walks in her dreams. And she's going to say exists within the places between, that this notion of her lost daughter haunts her. And I really do appreciate Perkins's uh, shift here, cutting from that medium to long shot into the close up, seeking, seeing, um, you know, Rose's nodding gesturally, indicating that she herself has come to understand that she has unfinished business. 
diegetically, it is clearly about her desire to find her daughter, Emily. Okay, it is been 28 plus days. The moon serving as a chronological metaphor and motif in the film is marking time through duration of the film. Okay, and in doing so, she is aware that her daughter has been gone for a period of time. And her unfinished business is indicating that she is about to make a decision that flies in the face. It challenges white Australian notions in 1930 and in the early 21st century about white and black Australia's relationship with each other. And as a larger concept, we can see Perkins here articulating to us, the viewer, the importance of ideas of reconciliation, which was a uncertain concept in 2001 during the time of the Howard government, a disinterest in pursuing reconciliation that would not be seen effectively at a parliamentary level till 2008 with the Rudd Labor government. So she's nodding here. We're in beautiful close up, a very heroic shot here of her making a determination as a woman in 1930 to challenge the authority of her husband, a character surrogate for male masculinity and autocracy of the time. And she is stepping out. She is challenging his decree earlier in the film in This Is My Land, This Land Is Me, where he states, I I won't have blacks on my land. And she realizes she must invite Albert onto her land so that he may engage with his country and help her find Emily, which serves also as a beautiful allegory for the white, I suppose, um, sympathetic experience of what Indigenous communities went through during the Stolen Generation. Unfinished business. I love the fact that she's donned this shroud, this uh, shawl, which, you know, as part of the wardrobe and the mise-en-scene, serves as a beautiful symbol as part of a funeral shroud. Her preparation for the expectation of finding her daughter deceased. Despite her fear, despite her apprehensions about what she will find at the end of this journey, she boldly steps out into this new world. She's going into Albert's country. She's going into Albert's land. She's crossing the divide and stepping into the world of the other. And I think in a way Perkins is using her directorial voice through these techniques to encourage the audience to explore the connection between black and white Australia. Wonderful shot here, immediately transition to the woodlands outside of Albert's home. We clearly see her gaze, her offer gaze looking out towards Albert's home. We can hear the diegetic cutting of the wood, the continued non-diegetic score played by the guitar riffs and chords accompanying us on this journey as they're about to explore. Sang my praises far and wide. Now, a few things to note in this scene. Albert's part in this duet explores his sense as an Aboriginal man of great renown. Remember, based on the historical figure of Alexander Riley, Albert Yang serves as an Aboriginal surrogate for the plight and suffering of Aboriginal people both during this time and even now. We have to look at the fact that he sings these beautiful lyrics harmonized by these guitar chords and riffs in synchronicity with the cutting of his wood axe as he develops in frustration. We'll notice that. We'll notice the escalation in the strikes of the axe as he becomes increasingly frustrated and despondent with the response of white Australia to him. And in a way, Perkins is communicating to us the fact that this is something that Indigenous communities experience. And when we look contextually, it's not just in 1930, a period just before the assimilation policy and the period that will become uh, absolutely despicably known as the Stolen Generation, but also the experience of Aboriginal Australia 2001, where nine years post Mabo, and even in 2023 and onwards, 
the fact that even in recent times, Aboriginal Australians are still treated with derision and disrespect. And I think Albert serves and Perkins aids through her directorial voice that communication about the place of Aboriginal Australians in modern society. But it didn't mean a thing They saddled me with prizes Just a swag full of nothing Notice that again. The building up of Albert's momentum in cutting with the axe, the frustration evident, the the sync the sync uh, Renai strikes of the axe on wood, okay, echoing his frustrations and finishing his verse with a swag full of nothing, the the rich symbolism of the swag, the traveler's bag, the wanderer seeking his place in this country. An experience of Indigenous communities who have been moved off of country and are now desiring to be reconnected with country, okay, and finding their place in the world. Remember Albert as a character. He's a decorated Australian. He is an individual who is an Anzac veteran. He is an honoured policeman. He is a recognised tracker. But despite that, Jim, as the surrogate character, for the symbolism of white Australia at this period and, I suppose, the bigoted, racist attitudes of Australians today towards Aboriginal Australians, both then and now, okay? And he's echoing those frustrations. So you can talk about that cultural experience of frustration and experiencing racism due to the colour of their skin, the creeds that they bear to, and their aboriginality. And we're going to immediately now cut in this beautiful part where both of them sing part of the duet in synchronicity, showing their harmonized attitudes towards this unfinished business. Emily seeking her daughter, trying to recover her, fighting against the frustrations of a husband who will not see reason and not seek the help of those who clearly, despite the color of their skin and their heritage, actually know what needs to be done and albert a man who is aware of where this girl is he has the proficiency and the fortitude to find emily but despite that unfortunately due to his aboriginality he is disconnected from the search because as jim said before i don't want any darkies in the search i don't want blacks on my land and that issue of land of Albert belonging to the land and Jim believing that land belongs to him. And that is a recurring discussion that Perkins wants us to have. Just a swag full of nothing. I love this gaze here, the way that Albert stops and you see his offer gaze. You see him look out. They don't look in towards the camera. They're looking just off camera. He's looking towards Emily and Emily, uh, sorry, uh, Rose. And Rose herself is also looking towards Albert as she walks through these woods, these rich, verdant, picturesque fields, okay, which symbolize Albert's connection to country, reinforce his aboriginality, okay, as she goes to him to seek his help. There is reconciliation here. And we'll see in a couple of seconds here how there is no dialogue between them. It is all through song through this lyrical duet that they unpack that bigger concept of the conversation in Australian culture about reconciliation. Unfinished business Keeping us And the depth you can go to, ladies and gentlemen, talking about that line in the lyrics, keeping us sleepless. Not only is Albert uh, diminished in character because he wishes to help but is unable to do so due to the stringent requirements of society for him to fall to the decrees of white Australia, completely disempowered from, abil- from his ability to help, and Emily and, and, and Rose, who's seeking Emily and is absolutely desperate to find her daughter. But also, on a deeper level, the subtext, the conceptuality of this scene where 
uh, Albert and Rose want to reconnect and be walking towards reconciliation. Unfinished business. And I love this rule of third shot at the conclusion of the song as it moves towards Little Bones. But that idea of the rule of thirds of the rock, Albert and Rose and the rock and how they're traveling into country. Notice in the background, the Ryan homestead. Notice the trench line, okay? A border mark of Jim's quote unquote property, his land. And obviously Albert and Rose have started their journey on that land. Going back to the sergeant earlier on in my land, this is my land, this land is me, where he says, this is Albert's country. Okay, and that acknowledgement, that deep acknowledgement of the importance of country to Aboriginal Australia. But then, of course, you know, Jim's absolutely bigoted attitude, his 1930s, his 2001 attitude towards land as a white Australian, you know, a greater concept of maybe governmental attitudes, societal attitudes, and how it diminishes Albert's character and Perkins trying to have that conversation with us. But notice this beautiful mise-en-scene. The conclusion of the song played out in guitar riffs and chords as they travel out into the country. And it's going to end with just this really small amount of dialogue. And remember the importance of minimal dialogue. There is a dialogue economy, an economy of words in this text, where Perkins wants us to be aware that it's not the words that express ideas in this text. It's the cinematography It's the musicality that conveys those rich ideas. You and me. You and me, ladies and gentlemen. If there's no quote better fixed for that discussion on reconciliation, unfinished business, keeping us sleepless, unfinished business, you and me. Okay, so remember, on the surface, in the diegesis of the film, Rose looking for her daughter, unable to rest until she finds her, seeking the help by breaking social conventions as a white woman at this time, the aid of this Aboriginal tracker, this honoured, respected individual, Albert Yang, going forth into his country to seek his help and him being prepared to assist her in his unfinished business of finding this young girl knowing he can do it, and finally being able to conclude this chapter in his story. But also reconciliation, that conversation. Perkins asking us to think about the unfinished business of the building the bridge between white and black Australia. And the chords close off. They've reached their, they've reached their, their zenith. The music fades out and there's only a few spoken lines here. Emily, follow the moon. Kids, follow light. Emily, follow the moon. Kids, follow light. That expertise, that low angle shot of Albert heroically declaring that she is heading in this direction, that as a child she followed the moon and the rich extended metaphoric motif of the moon throughout the film as it rises over the mountains. We're in Rose's point of view here, watching the moon rise as her daughter would have watched the moon rise, indicating a full month, a full month's transition. We are now 28 plus days since Emily went missing. So we already have this beautiful foreshadowing of the tragic end to this film. And that's the end of the scene, ladies and gentlemen. It's transitioning now into the interstitial musical number that leads us towards Little Bones, which will be the scene in which there's revelation. Albert finds and discovers the remains of Emily. We have that beautiful, powerful musical soliloquy of Rose expressing her lamentations for the loss of her daughter, a real sense of dread. The first of two funeral dirges 
that will occur in this musical piece. And remember, the, the, the musical genres within this film are very rich. They shift from Western to Indigenous to, you know, uh, traditional Christian funeral dirges. So there's quite an array of cultural voices through music that are explored. I hope this has been helpful, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, feel free to follow along as I unpack the last two important pieces of music in a follow-up video. It will be Little Bones and it will be Breathe On Me. Take care.